Greetings, Zimbabwe, Africa, and the world. Welcome to another episode of In Conversation with Trevor, where we go beyond the headlines and beyond the sensational. Today, we are in conversation with the chairperson of the Zimbabwe Public Service Commission, Dr. Vincent Hungwe. Welcome to uh, In Conversation with Trevor, Thank Dr. Vincent Hungwe. Thank you very, Thank much, you very much for this uh, opportunity. You have had an illustrious career, um, starting as a teacher, uh, lecturer, uh, joining the civil service, uh, and um, f going to uh, United Nations Development Program. And now you're back in Zim. Why, why are you back uh, at a time as, as, as this? Some people would think, hey, this is the time to be out in the diaspora. Um, thank you very much for that. And also characterizing my career as illustrious. It's the first time somebody has done, has done so. Um, I've been uh, in government, uh, in public service, if you like, for about um, 25 years and um, uh, also in international civil service for about uh, seven, eight years. And um, I, come I came back to Zimbabwe in December 2017 at a very uh, momentous time uh, in the history of, uh, of our country um, where there were new opportunities for Zimbabweans to communicate the message eloquently that uh, the responsibility of uh, building a new Zimbabwe consistent with the vision that has been so uh, eloquently and lucidly articulated by His Excellency President um, Emerson Mnangagwa of um, creating, uh, transforming Zimbabwe into an uh, upper middle income economy and society um, uh, cannot be cannot be farmed out to anybody. It is the responsibility of citizens. And citizens have um, to demonstrate that they're committed to that particular call. So you're ready for the assignment? Pretty much. So the, you, you reading through this document, yeah. you talk about uh, work-life balance. What does uh, work-life ba balance look like for uh, uh, Dr. Hungwe? Mm -hmm. uh, how do you relax? Work-life balance is all about ensuring that um, uh, persons that commit themselves to doing certain things within the private and the public domain also have lives. Uh, lives as uh, uh, children, as uh, fathers, as mothers, as grandmothers, as grandfathers, and also they have friends because they are part and parcel of community. For me, work-life balance is really about uh, giving the best I can um, when the time so requires, but also making it possible for me to be um, uh, with friends and family. And for me, it is about playing football, used to be, but it's now become very dangerous because of my age. Uh, but I've now migrated to, to playing uh, a lot of golf. I'm an avid uh, golf player. Well, what are you reading now? What book are you reading? Do you, do you love reading? I, I, I read quite a lot, but I also uh, uh, am forced to read from time to time by my wife. Uh, recently, she bought about two books for me. Uh, I'm happy you have asked about this. Uh, the book by uh, Tom Nichols is called The Death of Expertise. Some kind of uh, a tour de force of sorts that seeks to... Uh, campaign against the um, ever-increasing um, uh, wave of, uh, of, uh, of, uh, of attacks against uh, specialists, against uh, experts, and uh, some kind of a blaring, if you like, of um, a f fact on one hand, and, uh, and opinion, and in some instances, outright lies on the other. Interesting. Mm -hmm. I've, I've gone through the um, Public Service Commission strategy plan. It's, it's an amazing document. Thank if, you very much. 
if all that is in here was implemented, mm -hmm. we would have an amazing uh, public service commission mm -hmm. and uh, amazing civil service. W what is the risk of this gathering dusk in another uh, cupboard somewhere? Well, the risk of it uh, gathering dust on the shelves, as it were, is uh, very limited, if uh, existent at all. Why? Because of uh, the nature of the document itself. Um, uh, I'm happy you recognize the, uh, the substance of it, but it is a substance that, in fact, was not um, uh, born out of the Public Service Commission, as it were. It is a substance that pretty much reflects the author of that document. And the author of that document, as I've said before, is His Excellency the President of uh, Zimbabwe, Comrade uh, uh, Emerson Munangabwe. Um, the purpose, which is pretty much indicated in the vision, the organizational structure that is required to, to drive it, and the fundamental principles and values that underpin it, uh, things that the President himself has been articulating uh, for over uh, the past uh, uh, 18 to 24, 24 months. What's fascinated me is um, the authority uh, around the document of we want, as a commission, you want to be in charge. Correct. Uh, in directing uh, the civil service uh, and the commission in, in, in making sure that uh, delivery of service, delivery of... Uh, uh, quality service to the to the public, which is something which is not we're not used to seeing that there is force in this document uh, of wanting to change the thinking, of wanting to change the thing things that have been done. Just take me through the principles that uh, guided you uh, in the process of getting to this document. The principles that uh, guided us um, pretty much um, arise out of uh, the policy clarity that um, has been pr uh, presented to us. It's very clear that uh, in order for us to get to 2030 as an upper middle income society and economy, um, there is going to be very significant uh, pivoting in the nature of the leadership that is required. There is going to be significant pivoting away from an excessive preoccupation with the, the politics of our country. Very important. But at the end of the day, uh, good politics is always a function of good economics. And the pivoting towards um, uh, in enhancing economic growth as the basis upon which sustainable social development and political stability can be, pre can be predicated is a very, very important fundamental uh, principle that has uh, that has uh, informed us. Talk to me about the you transforming the commission to being an employer, because most of us uh, uh, used to know the commission as an employer uh, for government or providing that service for mm -hmm. government. But now this is transformative. Yep. Talk to me about that yep. and, and, and any headwinds that you're facing in that regard. Yes, um, it's all about, uh, it's all also about um, uh, uh, mindsets. Um, the, commission, the commission can no longer continue to become inward looking. Its vision hitherto has, has been that we want to be the employer of choice. There's, there's nothing wrong with that. But being an employer of choice must have a strategic purpose behind it. Being an employment of choice means that you have got a particular, a higher level objective purpose, mandate, and vision. And that purpose is to ensure that we will create the necessary, the necessary uh, capacities within the public sector itself to be able to understand what its mandate is about, to be able to understand what its functions are, to be able to understand how those uh, strategic interventions that are required to achieve a mandate can actually be effectively facilitated. So the Public Service Commission is no longer going to be inward looking. It is actually going to be outward looking, not to become 
necessarily an employer of choice and end there, but to be an employer of choice that has got the capacity to effectively facilitate what each and every one of our delivery units in the form of line ministries, their departments and agencies can actually do on the ground. And that in itself requires a very fundamental transformative uh, change in terms of how we think and do our work. And over the years, you will find that the Public Service Commission has, because of this inward-looking perspective of what its mandate is about, has also tended to focus on, no, we are about recruiting people, appointing them, and ending there. Now the question is more fundamental and deeper than that. The question is, what is the nature of the structure that the person that we are going to uh, um, uh, 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 recruit going to be like? What is the nature of the skills, the knowledge that that person must have? What is the nature of the values that that person must expose in the way they conduct themselves and in the way that they do business? We must move away from uh, an understanding that says performance can no longer be an issue. We want a new culture blueprint that says we are going to be high performance motivated, we are going to be accountable, we are going to be responsive, we are going to be uh, more ethical in the way we do our business, and we are also going to be able to ask questions about the extent to which we are actually achieving the um, vision that the president has articulated. You, you've got a huge mandate. I mean, uh, the, um, how many people are we talking about that fall under the commission, that fall under the civil service, and are you able to break them down into gender, uh, into professional and, and non-professional? Yes. Um, the public service, as we currently stand, is about 205,000 employees and by public and I'm leaving out the armed forces sure. um, the, the Zimbabwe National Army the police and prisons and correctional services 57 percent of those employees are women so we are doing well from that global aggregate perspective and 64 um, uh, uh, percent of those are young people between 25 and 45 years and 62% um, are in the ministries of education, primary, secondary education. And uh, if we put in the health sector, the number increases to 82%. And I was looking at the total picture of um, the number of directors, deputy directors, directors, chief directors, and permanent secretaries. It's not a lot, it's about 1,000, maybe 100 people. But there we have a very, very uh, serious challenge with respect to gender. Um, uh, we have recently uh, established that 68% uh, of those people at the higher levels are male, and therefore we need to address that uh, issue. They're older and male, too, they, isn't they're it? Older mm. and male, in mm. fact. Um, about 52% um, um, uh, of deputy directors and above are above 48 years old. So yes, uh, they are older and male, but also we are sitting on a very interesting civil service demographic dividend, if you like, of 68% uh, of our employees between being between 25 and, and 45 and 45 years. That's a yes. good thing. Yeah. That's a good so, thing. So, but the critical issue, Trevor, is this, and I come back to the fundamental values and principles that must act underpin the way we are going to do our business. There are certain things that we have been doing in the past that actually belong to the past. The nature of our uptake of technology and systems that are pretty much consistent with our capacity to remain competitive in terms of the pricing and in terms of the accessibility of our services requires a transformation that is technologically based. 
And in the majority of cases, those very same people that we are talking about as constituting our civil service demographic dividend potential require some kind of a transition from old-fashioned ways of doing business, from old-fashioned work processes to work processes that are likely to be more efficient, more cost-effective in terms of the delivery of services. You've, you've spoken yeah. about um, the, the, the new workplace yes. and the resistance to technology within, Absolutely. The, within the civil service. This is exactly talk, talk to me about yes. that. Um, you know, it's a, it's a, it's, 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 it's a pity that uh, the very same age group that we talked about, which is above your deputy director, director, all the way to permanent secretaries, um, seem to be quite um, resistant, but uh, uh, over, over... Why? Oh, well, I suppose because it's a mindset. There has never been a, a, a very pointed, um, a pointed uh, uh, plan, structure, and uh, uh, operation that uh, has uh, sought to enhance their um, either technological nous or technological So they're afraid of technology. They're, they're afraid. afraid of change. What are you going to do to make sure that this happens? Well, we have, we have put in place, we have been put in place a, a mechanism between ourselves, Office of the President, and in particular the e-government unit within the Office of the President, and also with the Ministry responsible for information, communication, technology, to ensure that uh, we are going to provide the requisite training in order for them to uptake in terms of the skills and the knowledge required. We, we've already gotten into the, the, the question that you, you asked as we embarked onto, onto this uh, mammoth project, yes. which is, is the civil service fit for, pur for purpose? Correct. And I must quote what you said yeah. here, which I found interesting. You said, as you asked this question, we experienced an excruciating mix of embarrassment with the answers we got and an anguish and frustration with the terrain we have to cover. Mm -hmm. Talk to me about the embarrassment that you, you've had to, 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 to discover yes. as you try to understand the civil service of the past and where you want to take the civil service. Well, the embarrassment is also in the, in the, in the, in the analytical document. If one were to go through the SWOT analysis that we undertook and the PESTEL that we also undertook, uh, you, you will find the instances of embarrassment. Let me um, uh, lay this one out for you. Government um, has got 21 ministries. Throw in the office of the president, throw in the public service. You would expect normally to have 21 chief accounting officers mm -hmm. in the ministry. When we came in in July 2018, in fact, we recognized that at the level of permanent secretaries, which included our principal directors, chief directors, and so forth, we were sitting on something like 98 individuals. Right? These are people who are sitting at the level of chief accounting officer. Going for 21 ministries. For 21 ministries. And, of course, they go under very interesting uh, monikers of uh, permanent secretary, accounting permanent secretary, non-accounting principal director, senior principal director, and all those kind of things. And of course, that was an embarrassing situation. We want a situation where each and every ministry has got a chief accounting officer. That is the beginning of the story, and that's where it ends, right? And um, we have um, uh, taken steps to ensure that that issue is actually uh, well, What steps addressed. have you taken there? Uh, well, the majority of uh, the uh, principal directors and the permanent secretaries, some of them have already been sent on, on retirement. In, in, in many instances... Do we have number, specific numbers there? Yes, I think uh, we, uh, when we had uh, the new uh, cabinet announced uh, some time after the July um, elections of uh, 2018, uh, we uh, reduced the, the number of all accounting permanent secretaries to equal the number of the uh, line ministries that His Excellency um, uh, established. And um, we keep on addressing, addressing that, uh, that, that, uh, that issue. And um, 
it's, it's, it's an ongoing, it's an ongoing, uh, it's an ongoing process. Quickly, looking at your pa the pastel analysis that you yes. talked about, mm -hmm. I was surprised to find you have a line there mm -hmm. that says there are certain civil service who are not committed to uh, uh, government programs. Uh, does that concern you? It um, it does it does especially especially uh, when the commitment is lacking at um, uh, in zones where you expect the greatest potential in terms of delivery as you move uh, as you move as you move forward but some of these things also arise out of the fact that there is no uh, pointed focused attention at changing mindsets at um, making uh, persons uh, more patriotic recognizing the kind of roles that they have to play and um, uh, recognizing the nature of the attitudes that they have to bring they have to bring to work some of them also arise out of uh, lack of capacity on our part as leaders to actually uh, demonstrate in terms of the way we behave and in terms of the way we do our own work it 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 does it's not very easy for your youngsters within the civil service to become committed if the permanent secretary on a day-to-day -day basis is not at work. There's a disjuncture sometimes mm -hmm. between what the president says and what you see happening at the civil servant level, mm -hmm. uh, which says, which raises the question, do some people get the president's mantra of a new dispensation of Zimbabwe is open, open for business because you do see conduct mm -hmm. and behavior mm -hmm. that goes counter those two mantras. Mm -hmm. Zimbabwe is open for business, the 2030 uh, um, vision, and you say to yourself, do these people, senior civil service, get that mindset? Have they changed their mindset or they belong to the past? What's your view on that? Yeah, they could well belong to the past, but our experience is that um, the uptake of uh, the new attitude, the direction in which we would want to go, has been quite, uh, has been quite uh, interesting on the part of the um, chief accounting officers that we have. Um, in the sense that, um, remember this time around, uh, we did not necessarily confine ourselves to recruiting people at the level of chief accounting officers from the civil service. For the first time, we also have recruited civil servants from outside, outside the civil service. In some instances, from even from the diaspora, we have quite a number of permanent secretaries that have come back to um, to, to, to to serve, and um, um, that in itself has injected some um, element of um, of uh, of commitment, uh, some element of. Um, uh, 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 patriotism and some element of um, wanting to uh, own the results that are going to come from the work that we do. You've spoken quite eloquently about uh, a new culture blueprint. Yes. And as you know, um, um, Peter Drake has said uh, culture is a strategy for breakfast. Correct. And uh, uh, Katie Kaufman and Kathy mm -hmm. Sorensen have come up and said culture actually is a, a strategy for lunch. Mm -hmm. um, what are you going to do to drive this culture change? This new culture blueprint that, that, that you have could be dead um, before arrival. Mm -hmm. um, if the culture uh, drive is not, is, is, is not forcefully uh, implemented. Yes, you are, you, you, you are, you are right. Um, our, in, our, in our structure, we have a, 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 an entire agency that is going to um, um, uh, focus the greater proportion of its, uh, of its energies, plans and work, on matters relating to strategic planning and program management. And um, therein also lies the units that are going to drive an advocacy dimension, a communication dimension, and a culture change um, uh, agenda. 
and um, we are going to ensure that that very same approach is going to be cascaded in all in all in all the line ministries there is not going to be a line ministry that will not have advocates communication experts and change management change management um, uh, entities to drive uh, the culture change that we are that we are that we're looking at let's look at the values that you pursue in, in your new culture yes. uh, blueprint which mm -hmm. to me look very impressive if yes. you could just un unpack them and and see what effect they will have in actually changing the attitudes of the civil service and the service that they give to the public uh, the first one really is about about patriotism mm -hmm. um, the responsibility for making Zimbabwe a better country for all its citizens lies with its citizens. It's not going to be possible to uh, contract out, to farm out that responsibility. So the issue of um, patriotism must be front of mind to us as we do the culture change. Um, uh, uh, as we uh, drive the culture change uh, agenda. The second one is high performance. Um, high performance pretty much entails the issue of uh, planning for performance and appraising performance and rewarding good performance and um, ensuring that you take action to align bad performance with purpose, right? Purpose of the organization. Uh, I'm, I'm moving away from punishing <laughs> non-performance. Non, 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 non and um, there, is a specific, there are specific units that are going to be uh, put in place for that. The other issue re re relates to um, ethical conduct. Mm? Uh, in the way public servants do their, their, their business. And as the Public Service Commission, we have committed ourselves to work very closely with the, um, uh, the Zimbabwe Anti-Corruption Commission in order to flush out any uh, public servants that um, would be involved in conduct that is um, unethical. Uh, there is also the issue around um, accountability uh, and accountability is pretty much about making sure that individuals are brought to account at all levels for the responsibilities and the resources that they have been given to be able to perform certain 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 functions and the other principle really is about monitoring and, e and evaluation each and every individual's performance must be tracked. Each and every individual's impact, sustainability of their actions, and the relevance, the effectiveness, the efficiency with which this is actually done um, must actually be evaluated um, on a biannual basis and on an, on an, on an annual basis. An so lastly, we also need to ensure that in order for people to be able then to meet all those standards, we must transform ourselves into a learning organization. An organization that accepts that uh, as you apply yourself, there's a possibility that you will make mistakes, but those mistakes then ought to be used as the basis upon which we can um, uh, predicate our improvements as we go, as we, as we go forward. There's been announced uh, the system of um, ensuring that people do come to work, that you don't have ghost workers, uh, the biometric um, uh, system. How far is that? Has it started uh, being implemented? And if so, are you seeing any results at all? Um, they, there's been established now uh, an interministerial, an interministerial committee that uh, is uh, uh, looking at that um, at that issue that is chaired by the. Um, Secretary of, uh, of, uh, of Commissions here and includes quite a number of other ministries, the Registrar, the Office of the Registrar General, Minister of Finance, um, our Salary Services Bureau and Pension Fund and the Pension Office, I beg your pardon, 
and the office of the president and, and cabinet. As we, as we speak, I think uh, plans are underway to uh, undertake some study uh, visits to, um, to Tanzania where uh, the biometric registration system has, um, at least on the basis of the reports that we have, uh, they have shared with us, has been uh, found to be quite effective with respect to um, dealing with the challenge around cost, cost, cost workers. workers. And of course, uh, we've uh, received support um, from um, two in entities, principally the United Nations Development Program and the World Bank to make sure that this becomes a reality. Do we have an idea age. of how many of these cost workers we have? I mean, it cost workers, do we know where they are, how many they we, are? We, it, would, it would be quite interesting. By their very nature, yes. ghosts, I'm told, um, <laughs> cannot, be, cannot be seen and cannot be counted. But um, um, the, there's a, there was an audit report that was uh, undertaken by the Public Service Commission. I think it was 2015, if I'm not, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, that pretty much um, indicates that um, they are individuals that uh, have been, that have been uh, that appear on our payroll, but in fact um, are not supposed to be and not supposed to be there. What's that? What number is that? Um, if I, if my my recollection serves me right, there was no specific figure that was given, mm -hmm. but there were instances that were identified uh, that could create that particular situation. There were instances where individuals could get to a primary school, for example, satellite primary school in a new resettlement area, total population of uh, peoples, maybe 300, 400. Under normal circumstances, you would have something like six, seven teachers. But yes, on the ground, there are six, seven teachers. But on the salary services bureau, there are maybe 10 or 11 teachers that are being paid. Wow. The, let, let's move now to uh, the efforts that you're now investing in to build a civil service that's fit for purpose. Mm -hmm. And I think critical to that is your um, remuneration structure. And I, I see that you are saying, saying that the Public Service Commission is moving away from um, rather leaning more towards non-monetary in incentives. Correct. Which will still cost. Mm -hmm. Um, do, you, do you want to help us understand what that is going to look like? Yes. Um, there's always been a, a tendency to want to look at salaries and conditions of service in purely monetary, monetary terms. Well, you're right. At the end of the day, everything, when you monetize it... It costs. It costs. But there has been a tendency to say... Now, in order for us to be effectively motivate, well, attract, motivate and retain our employees, we must pay higher salaries. That's, that, that's important. I'm not in any way suggesting that salaries are not important. But salaries ought to be looked at in the context of um, the total package of factors that effectively motivate mm. uh, employees. Right. It's not always a salary. There are a whole host of other, let's call them non-monetary, although we know we can monetize them, non-monetary benefits around career development, a clear career development path, uh, the ability to be able to create assets while you are working, the ability to be able to um, met, meet the basic needs of family while you are waiting, waking, working, and even in retirement, you know, to be able to send children to school, to be able to provide certain, uh, f certain facilities like transport, to be able to have a home, to be able to access medical care, uh, to be able to invest so that you can then begin to create assets that you can make use of as and when you are retired, and also to prepare for retirement. In other words, the pension that um, we define at the, right at the beginning must actually be sustainable in terms of its delivery. 
when somebody retires. Right. All these things, in our view, are very, very important. And you're and focusing on that. And you're we are working on ensure on that. that those are and part this, of the benefits. This yeah. is the context in which we have established a new agency called Pay, Benefit Development, and Benefit Management. And that benefit development is saying, how else can we ensure that beyond paying a salary, we can uh, mobilize other facilities in order for our employee to become better motivated and therefore provide us with the kind of service that we expect. I've looked at your um, uh, strategic plan results framework. Yes. Um, uh, how happy are you with the progress uh, as you tick the box in terms of what has been done and what has not been done? Uh, we, are, we are not happy with the progress this far and that's why we also indicated um, uh, to at, the, at the launch that uh, we want to everybody to keep us on our to keep us on our on our toes. It would have been our expectation that by now we should actually be not talking about assisting line ministries with the structures that they ought to be uh, 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 having in order to drive their 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 mandates. But there are instances where this is uh, this is uh, this is happening but um, globally in aggregate terms we are confident that come december 2020 all the barriers the challenges around policies around systems around institutions around structures around processes around attitudes and so forth ought to have actually been um, uh, cleared off of the way. Um, Dr. Hungwe, yes. the, there are still certain places right now which frighten a lot of Zimbabweans to uh, come to face to face with the civil service. The passport office, yes. um, immigration at our border posts, uh, attitudes have not changed. Um, the attitudes of civil services they see themselves as being there to say no and to make the life of uh, citizens difficult. Mm -hmm. the, this success of our economic reform mm -hmm. will stand and fall mm -hmm. on the basis of your ability to yeah. implement this. What assurances can you give Zimbabweans that the, the experience that they're get, getting at the border posts, uh, passport offices and that kind of stuff, mm -hmm ought to be a thing of the past by the time this strategic document has been implemented? Um, not by the time the strategy has been implemented, but within the time frames that the strategy indicates that some of these problems ought to have been um, addressed. Um, one of the, one of the uh, challenges that, uh, that we have uh, is this over-reliance on the human, human interface. Yeah. And um, it happens in different domains. And uh, the cases that you adverted to uh, uh, are relevant in this regard. And one of the things that we are doing at the registrar's office is to ensure that we reduce that human interface to, to the extent, to the extent, uh, to the extent possible. But that does not entail that we are going to get rid of human beings. So a combination of technology-related interventions, changing our uh, workflow systems, and also changing the attitudes of civil servants is going to pretty much contribute to the resolution of, that, um, of the problems that, uh, that, that, that you mentioned. Here, the Public Service Commission, we have also been told that uh, because of the human interface, many people end up being employed in the civil service than uh, who ought not to be there. Why? Because the human interface has actually intervened to uh, allow them to worm their way into the into the civil service, and we are working on. Uh, making sure that we transfer our um, recruitment, selection, and appointment, promotion processes 
onto an ICT based uh, platforms. This document, um, Dr. Hungwe, has, is so candid. And I encourage a lot of Zimbabweans who want to um, understand what yeah. you're trying to do mm -hmm. to get a, a, a copy and read. Mm -hmm. I'm going to read a paragraph yeah. here and then ask you uh, my, my last question. Okay. You, you say uh, risks abound in the public sector and it manifests uh, uh, as employees coming to work and doing no work. The prevalence of ghost workers and deceased persons appearing on pay sheets and pension schedules inadequate systems and procedures in sensitive areas, loss of assets through theft, negligence, ineffectual employment resource, of resources, uh, no performance measures, and, and all that kind of stuff. Correct. What assurance as the number one mm -hmm. implementer of this strategy uh, can you give to Zimbabweans? I'm going to give you an opportunity now to address Zimbabweans regarding these shortfalls that you yourself has so candidly um, identified? My, my, my immediate reaction to Zimbabweans is that they can rest assured that the Public Service Commission uh, under our charge will adopt a, an attitude that says there is not going to be anybody who will be spared the road if the road becomes a necessary instrument in order for us to be able to transition from a culture that is characterized by the maladies of the nature that you articulated to one where the civil service is characterized by a high performance culture, a culture of accountability, a culture that respects ethical conduct, and a culture that also um, ensures that each and every person is actually rewarded on the basis of their performance. And a culture that says non-performance has got no place within the civil service. Sounds like this is the end of uh, the uncivil servant. Absolutely, I agree with you. Dr. Ungwe, thank you so thank much you for coming much. on to In Conversation with Trevor. I do, thank you for do. your time. Thank you for welcoming us uh, into your offices. We do appreciate the um, ever opening up of opportunities for us to have these kind of national conversations because it is only on the basis of conversations of this nature that uh, we are better able to identify where the gaps are and the nature of the interventions that are required in order to close them. Thank you so much. Thank you very time. much. I appreciate it. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks for watching. Don't want to miss out on these insightful conversations. Subscribe to our YouTube channel.